Hari Om, thank you very much for inviting me and for the wonderful introduction. Uh, as Swamiji said, Swamiji is right. Uh, as a young boy in Delhi, I was taken by my parents to uh, Swami Chinmayan's Gita classes every year during the summer. In uh, the center of Delhi, in Kanak Place, where now they have high rise buildings, there used to be a park. And Swamiji had the BMI chart and a long stick, you would point at it. And so the kids would sit on the floor and the adults on the chairs. And every evening, after my father came home from office, we used to all go there. And uh, every day he would teach more and more parts of the Gita and cover the whole Gita during the summer. So every year I did that. And then there were other influences from various sources. So this is a very good uh, foundation. What struck me as particularly impressive about uh, Swami Chinmayana was that there was no contradiction between the inner journey and the outer world. Often, our gurus and acharyas teaching us about Adhyatma Vidya make it sound, or students incorrectly pick it up as kind of escapism. Otherworldliness. It's mithya, it's maya, so why should I worry about society? Why should I talk? Why should I engage and debate other people? Why worry about problems? And Swamiji was doing both while teaching about the inner journey and the Adhyatma Vidya, and non dualism, and transcendence, and all those great things. He was, he embodied the spirit of engagement with the social, political, economic realities of the world. And uh, he was a true ambassador of our tradition, spoke at United Nations, spoke at schools and colleges, challenged media, arguing with journalists. A very uh, passionate person in terms of representing our civilization on the world stage. Truly, uh, I think since the first person who did this very successfully was in modern times was Swami Vivekananda. And I don't know if there was anyone between Swami Vivekananda and Swami Chinmayana, a huge gap of several generations. He was really doing that kind of work on the world stage. So that was a big milestone in our uh, history, I would say. And every time I meet uh, Vedantins who say, but we don't worry about others, I say, well, but Swami Chinmayana did. Or everything is one, so why should we worry about differences? I cite Swami Chinmayana. So I'm going to use this as a starting point to, for my discussion. My latest book is called Being Different. Being Different. It's an Indian dharmic view of Western thought, Western religions, Western civilization. And we know, you, you know, the term Purva Paksha, the study of other. The, Vedantins did Purva Paksha Buddhists, Buddhists did of the Vedantins, Vedantins did of another school, and the others, the Mamsa did of the Vedantins. So every worldview, every philosophy, every darshana did the Purva Paksha, did an analysis of the other. Studying the other with respect and giving an answer from one's own Siddhanta is a very important part of our tradition. Somehow, somehow, that tradition seemed to have died out or at least become very faint in recent times because hardly anyone is doing Purva Paksha of Western thought. So doing Purva Paksha of Buddhism today is not relevant because Buddhists are not the people at the gate that we have to combat intellectually. They are not the all-pervasive, the widespread, universalist thought that we have to take on like used to be the case in Adi Shankar's time. So today, the poor function we need, but we haven't done, are of the very big, aggressive, dominant religions out there. We have to do poor function of them to be able to teach our own people how to, how we are different, what is our position, how to talk back, what we think of some of their point of view. 
Now at the same time, this is not done with hostility or animosity or anything like that. It's debate. It's uh, out of love, out of all the ideas that we are ultimately one. The point is that in this manifested form, I'm occupying this body, the product of my past, my, uh, you know, karma and my conditioning. And you're occupying yours as a result of your conditioning. And you have certain points of view I disagree with. It's simple as that. If this were not desirable, there would be no need for the Gita, no need for the Mahabharata, there would be no, there, because there would be no point in discussing, debating, arguing with other people. So our whole tradition, unlike other traditions, is not based on blind faith and dogma, but on reasoning, on arguing, on questioning, on challenging. This is a very important point. So please don't feel that talking about how our tradition is different and talking about Guru Paksha of the West is in any way something disrespectful or undarmic, like some people think it is. So it's very much our way to be doing this. Now, if I use brand names, like a Hindu view of Christianity, it creates problems. So mine is more comparative philosophy. I'm taking a certain philosophical principle called X, and I'm looking at another philosophical principle called Y. I'm saying according to X, here is the issues with Y. And I'm not giving them brand names. I give them brand names in the book because then it's easy to explain what I'm talking about. But really I'm more interested in the philosophical principle rather than in, the, in any kind of institutional reality or organized religion or anything like that. So to give you an example of what I'm talking about, the idea of karma and reincarnation is very centrally embedded in our tradition, in our philosophy. The nature of who I am, the nature, the nature of the Atma, Aham Brahmasmi, Tattvamasi, the idea that I am Satchitanan or everyone is Satchitanan is very, very deep in our philosophy. So the question I had to come up with is, what is the core philosophy let's say Christianity, which is shared by all the denominations. And the core philosophy in Christianity is called the Nicene Creed. Nicene Creed because in the town of Nicaea, which is now in Turkey, it used to be part of the Roman Empire. I visited there two, three years ago. That's where the New Testament was developed and this codified requirement of belief called Nicene Creed was developed. Nicene Creed, you must understand what it is. And as philosophers, we must say, okay, how does the idea of Satchitana, Karma, Reincarnation, how does it relate to this, does it relate to it, are they compatible, where are the issues? That's how philosophy is done in our tradition. You take your point of view, you take somebody's point of view, you give a response. And you do it with respect. You disagree with respect. There's no hatred. It's just that we disagree. That's all. So the Nicene Creed basically says that Adam and Eve, did what we would call karma, bad karma. They did something wrong. And God curses them and says all future progeny, which means all of humanity because everybody came from them according to this story, all future progeny are cursed. They will be born sinners and go to hell. That's the curse. Now that sort of thing we never had in our tradition, that everybody is born we're told we're born such a tanam. We are all original, originally we are not sinners, originally we are such a tanam. We may be deluded, we may be confused, but the original essence is such a tanam. Whereas in the Nicene Creed, this is referred to as original sin, the doctrine of original sin. And this is not avoided. So then, many centuries later, God feels sorry and wants to help people because they're all suffering due to original sin. So he decides that his son will take birth and try to solve the problem, which only God can solve. Human beings can't solve it. There's another, another edict, another requirement in the Nicene Creed is that human beings cannot solve their own problem, which is different for us, because for us, only you can solve your own problem. Nobody else can solve it for you. In their case, you are incapable.
capable of solving this problem of original sin. So no amount of yoga, no amount of meditation, no amount of sadhana, no amount of bhakti can solve it. God has to send his son to do something which allows a solution. Without that intervention, solution is not possible. Therefore that Jesus event is necessary for you to believe, otherwise you cannot have a solution. And that's the reason Jesus is exclusive. Jesus' exclusivity cannot be denied and replaced by something else because only God taking that birth could bring about the solution. And for us, we don't even see we have the problem in the first place. So, if Jesus were born of a normal father, mother, like all of us are born, he would be progeny of Adam and Eve. And he would be born a sinner too. Because the curse, original sin curse, says all progeny of Adam and Eve are going to be born sinners. So if Jesus had a normal father, mother, through sex, they were, he was born, then he would also be a descendant of Adam and Eve. And under the original sin, he would also be cursed as a sinner at the time of birth. And if Jesus was born a sinner, how could he save other people if he is himself a sinner? So this would be a problem. That is why it is important that he had a virgin birth. Because he was not a project. That makes him not a progeny of Adam and Eve. Because Jesus had a virgin birth, he is not a descendant of Adam and Eve. Because his father is not a human being. Father is God. See? So, being born of God as the father, he is not a progeny of Adam and Eve. This is why the doctrine of virgin birth is not something nice, and coincidental, and trivial. It is absolutely necessary. Because if Jesus were not born of virgin birth, he himself would be born a sinner. And as a sinner, he cannot be a savior for other people. So you see how the doctrine of Nicene Creed is very logical, perfectly logical, with certain axioms and certain assumptions. It's logical. So there's original sin, then God takes virgin birth, his son comes as, virgin, as, as the only person who is not a born sinner. All other people, before Jesus and after Jesus, are born sinners. All of us are born sinners. Only Jesus, because he had virgin birth, and he's God's, God impregnates Virgin Mary, therefore he is the only one who is exempt from uh, original sin. This is very interesting. And then, Jesus takes the phala, what we would call the phala of a karma, the effect of a karma. He takes the whole burden of original sin, and says, I will be sacrificed. I will make the sacrifice on behalf of humanity and provide a cure for original sin through my sacrifice. And this is called substitutional atonement. It means that his suffering is a substitution for your suffering. So he has suffered so that you don't have to. So first, he, to be a savior, he has to be born without original sin, hence virgin. Second, he has to suffer to compensate, so you don't have to. So his suffering, is a, his crucifixion is a compensation, a debt for other humans not to face that debt. Now, from the karmic point of view, this is how philosophers argue. We have to give a response from a very philosophical point of view. First of all, Adam and Eve's <coughs> karma, no matter how bad, will only affect their future life not their children's life. I am not suffering because of my father's deeds, but because of my own previous life deeds. You see? And whatever deeds I am doing, the resulting Allah will be in my future life, not my children. It is not biologically transmitted. So in this book I say, karma is not a sexually transmitted condition. <laughs> it's an important point. Important point of difference. You should mention that when you discuss it. So sin is not something that is sexually transmitted. You, you bring your own karmic bondage from one life to the next to the next to the next. Our system does not fit a system where there is no reincarnation. Since there is no reincarnation, how is Adam and Eve's karma going to be carried out? How is the pulp going to be carried out since there is no idea of reincarnation? Therefore, they have to say to be carried out by the biological children. See, in our case, since we have the reincarnation, the burden is not going to be carried out after I die by my biological children, but my own next life.
So if you have the idea of reincarnation, it's very different than sexually transmitting it through your biological gene. This is a very big difference. Next difference is that if somebody does suffering, somebody does suffering, I cannot substitute what is coming to me by his suffering. I cannot get off the hook by simply saying, so and so suffered for me, I check the box saying I believe and I'm off the hook. I cannot do that. So, in a sense, what, Karma, what Jesus has done is like a bailout. Like a, we have the government, US government do a bailout of banks. So the government puts a lot of money to bail out those who are in debt. So Jesus is bailing out the karmic debt of all humanity by suffering on their behalf. This is not something that the karma system from our, in our philosophy allows. So the idea that somebody else has suffered and my karma is off the hook, and all I have to do is accept this historical fact, just sign that I accept, I'm a member, I, I accept, and I, my debt is clear, doesn't work. Anymore. So our philosophers in the past exactly argued like this against each other's positions. Buddhist positions, with our positions, and on and so on. And if people like Adi Shankara were alive, this is exactly how they would be talking. This is exactly the kind of food function they would be doing with nice and clean. And so in this book, I'm initiating a, a dialogue, a philosophical dialogue, from the point of view of the Dharma, giving responses, giving responses to the other uh, worldviews, uh, representing them authentically, quoting their own experts, quoting their own uh, texts and their own theologians and saying, okay, this is their position from the point of view of their axioms and their assumptions, it seems to be logical. But the way our system works, we cannot, we cannot reconcile. In fact, I show that if the idea of Nicene Creed, the assumptions of Nicene Creed have to be valid, then the whole karma and reincarnation has to be thrown out. You cannot reconcile. And if karma and reincarnation are valid, then you cannot accept the Nicene Creed. Notice, I'm not saying Christianity, I'm saying Nicene Creed. So it's a philosophical position. This means that there can be Christians who say, okay, we are Christians, but we don't believe in Nicene Creed. Yeah? So all you've done is you've refuted the Nicene Creed, but we believe in, Christ in Jesus without the Nicene Creed. Now, there are lots of Christians doing that. And in fact, there are lots of Christians who are saying we believe in Jesus like an avatar or like a rishi or like a yogi, but we don't believe in the rest of this nice entry. There are Christians there. And I'm writing another book on this new Christianity, which is very Hindu-like, to show that its origins are from Christian thinkers who had huge influence from Hinduism. So actually, one of the... Uh, one of the very fascinating things that has happened is, while Hindus have not done this kind of poor function of Christianity, many Christians of considerable reputation have of their own used Hinduism to critique Christianity. Exactly like I do. Many Christians since the 1800s have been studying, have lived in India, been influenced by Vedanta, and then criticized Christianity. Exactly like this. But then they haven't stopped there. They have then tried to reform Christianity, modify Christianity, change its interpretation to kind of make it more like Hinduism. So, when people tell me, one of the criticisms I have about your book is that you are assuming Christianity is like that, but Christianity is not like that. I have to tell them that Christianity is not like that for certain people only, and those people have been influenced by Hinduism to begin with. And this is something news to a lot of people, a lot of Christians, because the Hindu influences and Buddhist influences on the very liberal new kind of Christianity have been erased. People, the, the people who had these influences wrote about them, but after one or two generations, these influences got erased and people started thinking that this is kind of part of Christianity all the time, but it's very recent. So, this is one, what I just described to you. I, I call this this character, this characteristic of Western religions, in fact, all the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, 
I call this history centrism, which means that the historicity of the prophet and what happened historically to Jesus or what happened, what was done in the case of Moses for Judaism or the absolute historicity of the prophet Muhammad, that becomes so non-negotiable, totally inflexible because without knowing that history, people are doomed. You cannot understand the truth on your own. And there is no new preaching possible, there is no new enlightenment being possible who will come and discover this and teach you. Because that history happened once, it never happened before and it will never happen again. And you, you can only know the ultimate truth through that history. So you have to become a student of history. You have to continue studying history and history and history. That's why uh, when you go to Bible class, and I was raised in a Catholic school, so I know I went to Bible class. It basically a, a, a whole whole study of history, historicity, rather than philosophy. Whereas in our case, since everyone is such a tanand, what happened to a particular great person is good to know for inspiration, but not because it only happened to him, not because it can't happen to others. There is no state of consciousness that somebody had, which is not possible for me. Because this is my original nature and your original nature. And we are not fallen sinners. We are originally like that. So, if we believe that we are in fact in the state, the ultimate reality of the Atman is the ultimate reality of the cosmos, the ultimate state of Brahman, that is our nature. If that is who we are, then no history can be so unique that it can't happen again. Because it is our nature, it can happen to any of us. So, Raman Maharshi, when he achieved his enlightenment, he hadn't done it by quoting books or by reading the history of somebody else. He just had his own practice and he achieved enlightenment. After he achieved enlightenment, he read accounts of other people and said that my, my experience, Matt, is, is sort of uh, similar to what others have already said. It's not that I am parroting and therefore I am enlightened. Enlightenment is not a matter of parroting other people, parroting other historical characters. So our ex very experiential and embodied uh, you know, experience and the embodied uh, enlightenment that we focus on is very different from dependence on history. So in chapter 2, I contrast history centrism of the Abrahamic religions with embodied knowing, embodied experience, adhyatmic uh, you know, approach of the dharmic traditions. That's how I contrast these two. Now, to uh, uh, elaborate this point, make this point more clear, I'll tell you a little story. In Princeton, New Jersey, where I live, we have some seminary and some church nearby, and they're training missionaries, and then these young missionaries are sent to third world countries to evangelize and convert and preach. And before they are sent, they have to get some practice. So they go into the neighborhood and practice evangelizing. They go door to door to practice evangelizing. And so they come to my house also. And I always welcome them. I always bring them to the house, keep them nicely, serve them chai, talk to them. I know who they are, but I pretend like I don't know. I pretend like I'm some dumb guy who's just come on, come from somewhere and I'm just nice people and entertain. But I can tell they dress very nicely, very formally, very clean cut, young men, women, good looking people, very polite. And so I bring them and just uh, let them be in the conversation. And part way into the conversation, small talk, one of them says, have you heard good news? Now, I know from my Catholic education or training, Good news means the Savior has come to save you from original sin. It's good news. Because it's like, hey, you know, pretty good news because you can be saved. But I don't want to sort of argue, hey, you know, that uh, I've been saved some other way. They are, they are trained that the guy will, uh, they should anticipate the guy will say, yeah, but I have been saved some other way. And then they say, no, no, your method of saving is not authentic. This is better authentic because saving can only be done by Son of God. and the guy you're talking about is not son of God and he didn't get sacrificed. So they have logic. 
So they want you to walk into that logic because they know how to answer. But I don't walk into that logic. I, I keep wondering, you know, so they say, have you, you heard, have you heard good news? So I say, what good news? What good news? Did you win the lottery? Did the stock market run up? Or, why, what is the good news? So they, 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 they don't know how to answer that. Then they have to, they have to tell me, no good news that, uh, uh, you know, we can be saved. So I say, but saved from what? I haven't done anything wrong. What have you done? You don't seem to be uh, people who've done anything wrong. What is, why do you have to be saved? So then they wonder, you know, this guy is really kind of, uh, he really needs help, you know. <laughs> so, so gradually they start coming to the point that um, it's original sin, we're all born sinners. So I says, very strange, why are we born sinners? And they would tell me, I didn't believe really like that. They would give me some very elementary you know, idea about what going on. And that's very fascinating. I said, oh, this is very amazing. I didn't know that we are all born sinners. I thought we are all nice people, you know, we are not anything wrong. So then they are trying to educate me about how the whole nice people. They don't use that term, but that's the idea, the mechanics. So then I tell them, I ask them, have you heard the Hindu movies? So they don't know what I brought. Hindu movies. Hindu movies. What? Because in their training manual there's no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> so they're thrown off because this is not something expected of somebody. So I say Hindu good news is that we are all originally divine. We are not, there is no original sin. Now, I have shifted the axiom from original sinner as the assumption to originally divine. This throws them off because they have never figured out or nobody has taught them how to answer that. So I tell them this is the Hindu good news. So Christian good news is that the doctor comes to you and says, I have a cure for your disease. In fact, I have the exclusive franchise. I am the only cure for disease. Anybody else, I'll prove to you is, is a quack doctor. I got a cure for disease. That's good news. But then another doctor comes and says, I have better news. You don't even have the disease. <laughs> so that is the comparison. I fa in fact, I trademarked uh, Hindu Good News and I have a HinduGoodNews.com. <laughs> if you go and go to www.HinduGoodNews.com, you will see a whole uh, explanation of what I just said to show you philosophical difference. And it is not that one system is right or wrong or better or worse, but that they start with a certain axiom and have a certain conclusion, consequence, very logical. We have different assumptions, different axioms. Their axiom is based on a historicity of transmission that somebody said this, he cited it from somebody who cited it from somebody. Ours is based on the experiential validation by rishis and yogis, generation after generation, who had this kind of enlightened experience and who taught us again and again the same validation. So it is not dependent on one particular historical event, but on, on something which is empirically validated again and again by a large number of people. Yeah? So, um, the, uh, so in this way, my book, Being Different, goes to each chapter is a major category of difference. One chapter is, chapter 5 is on how certain Sanskrit words can't be translated. Even if you speak English, like I'm English spoken speaking, because that's how we were educated. Whatever your language may be, there are certain words in Sanskrit you can introduce into your, like Shakti has no, Shakti can't be energy, because then it's like dead, something material like electricity or something. But Shakti is more than just a material thing like electricity or energy. If the divinity is gone, we would say it's energy. So if there is really no word for it in the English language. Like there is no word for yoga. It's just yoga. So if a civilization has had a certain experience, which is very unique to it, then it has some words for it. And another civilization which did not have that same experience will not have any word for it. When you map it to another language term, you've actually done a lot of violence, you've done some injustice, you distort it. Because any any mapping of Shakti into English or any mapping of yoga into English kind of is a distortion. So what you have to do is introduce into your English vocabulary, you have to introduce certain Sanskrit words. You should make Shakti part of your vocabulary, you should make Atman part of your vocabulary, 
Atman is not the same thing as soul in Christianity. Because soul, animals don't have. Atman, not only animals have, even plants have. It's a different idea. It's not the same idea. And the reincarnation which I just explained is so central. Souls don't reincarnate. So when you map your philosophy onto the idea of soul, the soul has one life, then it goes forever to heaven or hell. And the soul is in a dualistic separation from God, even in heaven. The souls live in God's mansion, like a guest. God is sort of guest. It's like a retirement plan. You go there, you live, you take God, you chocolates, you know, souls. Souls, that's what soul is. It is not like a unity consciousness idea. So there is no unity consciousness idea in our sense of the word. So when you lose a word, uh, the person who's done the translation knows what he really means by that, by his use of soul, what he means. He knows it. But as generations go by, they might not, they might miss out. Each generation might miss out what what that really meant, because the word Atman is gone. And so gradually over time, because of because our words have been digested into English, we our civilization and philosophy has also been digested into Western, Western thought. And then comes a time when people are so confused, they are saying, what's the difference? Everything is the same. See? And so, to revive the distinctiveness, I've written this book called Being Different. It would be much easier to write a book called Being Same. Many people, in fact, many publishers, many consultants, many advisors said, no, 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 don't write a book called Being Different. Write a book called Being Same. And it would be a bestseller. Because it's more popular, it's easier, people are going on, everybody going on saying how everything is the same. See? But this is not uh, as true to our tradition as pointing out differences. Now, people ask, isn't difference, talking about difference, going to create tension? It will create tension if we come at it from a posture of superiority or a posture of exclusivity. History-centric religions have that problem. Because in a history-centric religion, my truth depends on a certain historical event which cannot be negotiated, cannot be, done, cannot be modified, nothing can be changed. And from that point of view, any other historical claim has to be falsified. Because it impinges, it intrudes, it violates my exclusivity of history. The history I'm talking about is so unique and absolute that any other claim of history I have to fight it and finish it off because it will threaten me. So this is the problem of the history-centric religions, which is the deep character of the Abrahamic religions. And there is a built-in exclusivity. You cannot blame people, you cannot say that you are bad guys, they are good guys, but the worldview, the siddhanta, the philosophy, the axioms that they have been taught have a built-in requirement of exclusivity. And it is not the fault of the average person that he is required to believe that. And as long as he is required to believe that, Part of the belief is to falsify and negate and degrade, downgrade any other view because it violates that exclusivity claim. It's like you've been told, let's say, that you have the exclusive franchise of uh, selling some product here. Something. Some authority gave you the sole franchise to sell milk. Then it's important for your success to go around uh, telling anybody who's selling milk, anybody else, you've got to say it's not real milk, it is milford, it is poison, it is not bonafide, you know, because it threatens your exclusivity. So this exclusivity as a starting point is the reason for tension, not that difference is a problem. You can have difference with each of respect if you don't have the exclusivity. You can say I'm different, you're different, but we respect each other. It's not that I'm better or worse, but we're just different. And this kind of a difference with mutual respect is part of dharma. I go through great length to explain that this is part of dharma because dharma is based on the nature of the cosmos which is built on differences. You know, plants are different from each other, animals are different, geographical areas and climates are different. Okay. So people have different cultures, different skin types, different accents, different languages. It is not a problem to be different. In fact, we, can, we don't, it's not only mutual respect for difference, we can even celebrate difference. Because they're all forms and nam, rupa, of Brahman. All this is Leela. All this difference is Leela. So, being different 
is, is necessary to appreciate the Leela. It is not a problem and it is not a source of tension. The source of tension is exclusivity claims. And the exclusivity claims come from history centrism, the absolute nature of one particular history. And that comes from things like uh, separation of infinite separation of God and man. And a few prophets are sent once in a while to teach the truth. And these prophets have stopped coming. So we are prisoner of history. You see? Whereas the assumption of Satchitanan means it's not, we're not dependent on some historical prophets. We have living masters in every century. Somebody comes and revives them. So this is the nature of my work. And I, I, since we have a, a quota of time, I would really like to stop and uh, take questions that will make it more interesting. So thank you very much for listening.